Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome back to the Just Your Average Fisho Show, show number four. Four. We have absolute game fishing royalty with us this evening, talking all things Melbourne tuna. Before we get into the panel and the mood of wonderful questions that all of you uh, who follow us will ask, let's uh, do the little tidy shop thing and talk about who helps make this happen. Ben, our producer from We Are Technical, helping big businesses do all things conferencing in a technical world, live and digital. You need to look him up. If you don't know Zoom, if you want to conference with your people, get on board with our producer, Ben. Now we've got some absolute fantastic prizes tonight as well. Let me talk to you about those. Thanks to my local tackle store, Complete Angler Ringwood, we have the biggest local tuna lure pack going around and we've coupled the prize with uh, Ebb Tide Tackle. So all things uh, fishing royalty there in this pack. We've got hard bodies, we've got Samakis, we've got Helcos and we've got one little beautiful Jack Finn uh, Pelagius 90, which accounts for many of the local school uh, tuna from Topwater, which uh, one of our panellists will be talking about this evening. Uh, we've also got thanks very much to Steve Lewis at F SFT Australia over there in South Australia. He's giving two fantastic lure packs, uh, which are called Takumis. You get two different size ones, a 95 and a 125, I'm pretty sure. And they'll be sent to your door for asking good questions. If you follow the SFT Australia page, uh, and also SFT Australia on Instagram. You can't go wrong. Those SA boys have been catching some brilliant bluefin tuna on these little bad boys. And we'll be talking a lot more about top water with John as well uh, at the second half of the show. Now, all you need to do to win these fantastic prizes is ask a lot of questions this evening. Put your questions in there and our producer will put the best ones to air. And we're talking, of course, all things Melbourne bluefin tuna. And the reason why we're talking Melbourne bluefin tuna is because they're here and we can catch them. And uh, a lot of people did go out and catch some. Um, so let's just get straight into the show. Thank you all for following us. Give us a like and a thumbs up. Follow our guest pages. We're going to talk <laughs> about that. First of all, my first introduction this evening to Game Fishing Royalty, a fantastic charter operator of Dreamcatcher 2 Sport Fishing, Richie Abella, welcome to the show and thanks for coming on this evening. How are you, Justin? Um, Mate. Thanks for, uh, for the invite and uh, the chinwag tonight and I uh, hope the show goes well. I think we'll, uh, we've got a lot of info and, uh, and a lot of stuff to talk about. Fantastic. Now, Richie, you've been doing chartering for a very long time. Can you tell us a little bit of background to how did you get into chartering? How long have you been running uh, Dreamcatcher 2 sport fishing? And what is it that uh, you give your clients that's quite unique out there in a fishing charter game? Um, Justin, as, as for Dreamcatcher sport fishing as a business, it's probably one of the, I wouldn't say it's the longest uh, running charter business in, in Victoria. Um, as, a charter, as, as a fisherman, on the other hand, um, I've been doing big game fishing in Victoria, New South Wales for probably longer than anybody um, now in, in Victoria, longer than most. Um, but as a charter business, it's, it's something that I've, I've aspired to do for probably the last 25 years. And it was one of those things, I, I should do it, shouldn't I do it? I'm an electrician by trade. And it's a big step, you know, to, uh, to to step out of your trade and what you're used to and stuff like that, even though my passion was deep-rooted as, as fishing. And, you know, and many people that knew me would know that, you know, most of the times I did it so much that, you know, you would think I was a charter operator anyway. I fished that long and that hard. And I can't even tell you how many jobs I lost in electrician <laughs> back in the day because I was never at work when the fish were on, you know. Uh, but the, the opportunity came about five years ago and it was sort of a bit of a double-edged sword. It was an unfortunate thing that happened. Um, my previous boat, which was the first dream catcher, which was a 2300 series Nusa Cat, we lost that boat in a car accident on the uh, Hume Highway coming back from a marlin fishing trip, a really successful one. So it was a, it was a sad end to a very, very good 10 days of fishing. I think we caught 50 marlin in 10 days. Um, so that was a really, really sad end to that. I lost the boat. Um, it was a long process to get payouts with the insurance. The insurance eventually came through and I had the decision then of what I do. Do I get another boat similar, secondhand, what, you know, or do I 
just bite the bullet and, and go the whole hog and get a brand new one, get a built-in survey and, and lend my hand to uh, to something that I wanted to do for a long time. And uh, that's exactly what I did. Uh, I bought a new boat, a 3000 series Nissan Cat, and um, yeah, here we are today, Dreamcatcher 2 Sport Fishing. Uh, fantastic. Well, look, I could strongly suggest all of our viewers, and I'm sure many of your own followers, Richie, are joining us tonight. We're going to come back to you and start talking Melbourne tuna in a moment. I'd like to now introduce a fantastic game fisho, someone who I've known for a little bit while, uh, of a while and has been a wonderful supporter of the Mitch Mangling Club, doing a few talks with us on both freshwater fishing but also king fishing. Uh, top water enthusiast, ebb tide tackle proprietor, John Cahill. Welcome to the show, mate. Thank you for joining us. Justin, thank you very much, mate. Um, pleasure to be on and um, proud to be on in a panel with um, the same panellist, Richie Bella. That's a, that's a bit of a big deal. Well, you, you bring certainly a lot of uh, blue water credentials, mate, but one of your specialties and which is uh, a fantastic addition to this show is all things top water because a lot of people wouldn't know that there actually is not only a bluefin local uh, a tuna fishery, but also a very alive and well top water one, which you've proved time and time again. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got into ebb tide and 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 how it sort of morphed into this really a juggernaut of top water fishing experts? Yeah, so go, going back, uh, I think it was about 2010, 2011, I was writing a lot of magazine articles and I started to do a, a blog and through that blog, um, I sold a few T-shirts, you know, just it was just for fun, really. And I was pretty good friends with uh, Kyle Stacey from Jack's Lures. He, you know, he, he makes skirted lures. And Kyle makes a great lure, but he's not a great um, salesman. He hates dealing with the public. So he asked me to help him sell a few. So I, I used to do that through the blog. That kind of really shifted a gear when the next year I took a a year out of my life and I went and lived in Indonesia for 12 months and I really immersed myself in a lot of things, but um, hardcore into uh, top water fishing and GT fishing. I met some really influential and good people there. And uh, on the back end of my year in Indonesia, I opened um, the web store, which was back then called Ebb Tide Adventures, now Ebb Tide Tackle with, uh, with Andy Smith. Um, Andy was all over it. He, you know, he's worked in tackle stores for a, for a long time and been a, um, a rep for Frogleys. And uh, we've worked together hard with that business for like coming up to seriously. We, we, we're knocking on the door of a decade. And that's the business side of it. But from a fishing perspective, um, I, I don't use bait very often, man. Like I, I like to throw lures. So I, I will jig. But for the most part, if it, if it can be caught on a lure, that's what I do. And if I can catch it, especially on top water, um, being like right on the surface, then that's my uh, my jive kind of thing. And um, you'd be surprised how good a fishery we've got on our, on our doorstep for top water, um, both with kings and with, um, with obviously the bluefin that we're talking about tonight. Yeah, fantastic. All right, so we'll come back to you shortly to talk all things top water. I'd like to introduce our next guest and returning guest, Great mate, Just Your Average Fisho contributor, Anthony Sarek, mate. How are you this evening? Great to have you back on board talking Southern Bluefin Tuna. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's good to be here and uh, being amongst our uh, good guests. <laughs> now, look, uh, Anthony, you bring a bit of a different proportion to this show because we've got, you know, blue blue water fishing royalty here. And I don't, I know that you and I wouldn't call ourselves blue blue water royalty by any means. But I think what you do is you're going to add a bit of a dimension to the show because um, you and I talked about going out and catching a lot of fish. You and I didn't do it together, but you certainly smashed a few of the school fish and you take a very simple approach to your fishing Keep it simple. Use you know the same rods that you use for gummies and stuff like that. So um, I think that that's absolutely fantastic. Now, what are your thoughts on this new bluefin fishery down here in Melbourne for the Melbourne for the average fish hose, mate? Oh, look, bar, bar congested boat ramps. Um, I'm, I'm sure that all the tackle stores and um, all small businesses involved in fishing are absolutely loving it. Um, it, it has to have boost sales for them and. Um, by the looks of uh, how fast lures and that were going out the door, I'd say that uh, the tackle shops definitely benefited. 
Yeah, I think it certainly gave those tackle shops the snapper season that they didn't have. Um, look, I'm going to come back to you shortly, uh, Anth, and we're going to talk about some of the simpler ways that people can, can approach uh, school bluefin tuna here. And uh, we're going to hit off with uh, Richie Abella first, mate. Richie, obviously with someone of your experience, can you tell us a little bit of why you think the Melbourne bluefin tuna, tuna fishery has come? Why are they here? What What's making them be here? Because, you know... Five years ago, you might have heard of the odd one or two taken off a of Polo Bay that might have followed a whale or something like that. What, what, why has it gone bang? Is that the good work due to tuna preservation or is it a different food source? What's going on? Uh, look, Justin, there's, there's a few things, my theories, and, and, and a lot of them are got a bit of fact behind them. Um, you, you sort of mentioned something there that sort of, you know, we haven't seen him here before. I'm not sure that's entirely true. Um, we venture and gather a lot more. Boats and, and the enthusiasts are getting more, you know, more active, should I say, getting out there and, and stuff. So I can tell you right now, even beyond five years ago, they were there. Whether they were there in big numbers, um, I doubt they were anywhere near the numbers that they are right now. What I've seen out there now and, and the time I've spent there, there's certainly never been a month like that. But then coming into sort of Bass Strait waters close to our our heads, like Port Phillip heads, Western Port heads, that's not an uncommon thing. It, it, it's actually quite common, but they're never there for very long and, and it's a short burst and the numbers aren't there. The, the game changer this, this year is the enormous amount of baits that came in and the nice clean water, the temperatures were right. So many things are right. And yes, you, you're right, there's... there's it's an accumulation. It's the, the bluefin numbers are starting to bounce back. So naturally, we're going to see those that population mm. fish start to spread in areas that we probably haven't encountered them before, or certainly not in these numbers. So I think there's a combination of a lot of things going on. You've got good water currents that push at the right time of year. Okay, large, very, very large aggregation of bait, but the bait... See, it, all the other little bites that we've had, the bait's been pretty localised to certain small, tight areas, whereas this time, you know, in, in the past, bowen heads have had quite a lot of um, school tuna come in and they move off because they've got a lot of reef structures there in, in, in the headlands that they've got there off, um, off the front of there. But from, you know, from the, the, the distance, the sheer distance that we, we covered um, this season on these smaller fish to encounter fish from one end to the other and knowing people that fish beyond that and also encounter fish, it was all bait and current related. You know, the fish came in, if there's bait there, there's something to feed on, they very rarely leave. You'll see when that bait, when that bait starts to diminish, you'll start seeing the, the fish leave with them. And, and do you think, Richie, that with bait movement to bring those bluefin tuna in, do you think um, that, let, let's say, let's all hope that this occurs next year, but, you know, with winter being such a prevalent fishery for jumbos and, you know, Portland, Port Mac, Port Ferry, do you think that the localised tuna will stay locally to Melbourne at all or do you think that they move off because bait moves off as the waters are getting cold? Water temperature changes from year to year, tides kind of different time of year. I, I, I think... If, if they were to stay, Justin, and, and it's really hard, like we've been cut, our legs have been cut off, I've got no doubt that, you know, they were they were going to hang around for quite a lot longer, whether they're still there now. Look, we haven't fished for months now out there because of uh, this virus. But, you know, the, the odds are good that they would still be there even now. Um, you know, I've, I've tried to stay off the watching the currents and whatnot stuff now because it's actually quite depressing for me to be sitting here knowing where I can and should be going fishing and not being able to. Um, it, it's, it's been pretty tough doing that. Um, but we've, we've always had a summer tuna fishery in places like Portland, Warrnambool, um, Port Ferry. Um, so that's not uncommon. And so to see them just branch out down our way is really just an extension of that fishery and just the fish and the bait moving in large quantities down our way, you know, and, and I, I believe that we we could expect that to happen a little bit more regularly as as the tuna population starts to increase as well. Mm. You know, these fish are going to spread further and further. You know, they're going to keep looking for food, and, and while the water is still producing that amount of bait, 
and the conditions are right, we're going to start seeing fish there on a more regular basis as well. <clears throat> um, so question for you, let's now turn to the fishing side, the fishing aspect of it for anyone out there that might be giving tuna a go for the first time or, or, or hasn't done it a lot. Um, how do you approach uh, fishing for school bluefin tuna? And specifically, like, what are the different techniques that you use on the boat and how do you go about teaching people? Because obviously your charter experience is a really big lesson for people to, to watch and see you do and, and you get them involved on the boat. So how, how do you sort of approach it and what sort of gear should, should we be using? And if I said conditions are great, what do I do? Do I put a lure into the water? Do I put a skirt into the water? Do I have pillies on board to... to to, you know, chum, like, what, what are your thoughts? It, it, that's a great question, and <clears throat> there's no right or wrong answer for, for this one. It's, it's really being prepared for anything on any given day. And great thing about having someone like John, for instance, on this show, we'll, we'll go through and, and show how to be prepared for the way that these fish have changed. But being out in the water as much as I was this season on these little ones, um, really gave me a, a, a good insight into their feeding habits and how they changed them and how our fishing had to change to suit that to continue the success rate that we had. Um, you know, tuna fishing is tuna fishing. You, you know, you talk about tuna fishing, well, we're talking about southern bluefin tuna, our school fish. These fish were ranging from school fish to mid-range, what we had. We had some serious quality fish here. You know, we had fish in 150 kilos, there was definitely a couple of hooks that went over and into the 60 to 70 kilo mark that were lost. Um, you know, but you talk about tuna, you talk about yellowfin tuna, you talk about the barrels we got. The, the major differences with them is the food that they're eating and the water that they're swimming in, you know, whether they're semi-tropical, temperate waters, colder waters. That's going to dictate what they're eating, okay, and how they feed it, all right? And, and that's where you, you, you start talking about scaling down your tackle. Are we talking big fish? We're talking big fish. Well, you naturally have to have hooks that aren't going to straighten. Lures out of the packet generally won't cut it on the big fish. Um, but then you start talking little fish and you can scale down and start using normal hooks straight out of the packet. You know, you can you can pull out something like that, which is a, a smarky deep diver, um, and, and I'll run that straight out of the pack. But... I won't run that lure on a 37 kilo outfit. I know I'm dealing with a smaller fish here. Even if I do get a bigger fish on, um, I'm going to use tackle that's appropriate to that lure, meaning that I scale down the tackle down to, to 15 kilo gear. Even our spin outfits, even though I had sort of 50 and 60 pound braid on them, you know, we were still fishing lighter drags on those reels as to not, you know, pull hooks straighten hooks, you got to fish within within the you know within your tackle limits. You're chasing these bigger fish, you want to be go uh, sorry, smaller fish, you want to be going lighter. You want the action of the lure to be more aggressive. Um, you want the fish not to be spooked. So there's a multitude of things that go on there which <clears throat> dictate what you do on any given day. Now naturally on this fishery that we had this this year round, um, You'll always start. The, big, the biggest and first job of the day is always to find the fish, uh, Justin, and then you take it from there. Okay, so finding fish, we're looking for um, bird patches, um, fish breaking, you know, bait up on the, on the surface. What, what's a really good indication of activity of biting fish, Rich? Uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you a really good scenario. Two days in a row. You go out of Queenscliff or wherever you're going out of Port Phillip Heads, and this is the area, we, we're talking local tuna here, so I'll, I'll localise this and, and, and talk to you what goes through the mind of Richard Abella when he goes through the heads there. We go through yesterday, I caught a dozen fish quite easily. We got them close to the Lonsdale Lighthouse. We didn't need to travel too far. I go out tomorrow and the first thing I see is brown charcoal water, Okay. So in that very location that we were 24 hours earlier, that water looks different. Immediately I look and I say, right, something's changed. The bird life is scarce to none. Um, immediately you think, right, what's the tide doing? Right, tide's running out hard or it's coming in. The tide will have a big influence of pushing good or clean water in or out. Now, the difference between today, yesterday or tomorrow 
um, in this fishery that we had was, you know, pushing out from the 30 to 40 metre mark out to the 60 to 70 metre mark to get into that nice water. It was like a switch. It was like literally like a gate. You drove through it. You could see the birds. You got out of that water. That water cleaned up. You had that nicer blue water and boom, straight away on the tuna. That could change tomorrow. But these are the things that automatically as a captain, as a skipper, when you're driving out, eyes are on the water immediately. You, you, it's not just the birds. The birds are absent when that's, that, that water's not there. You get other different birds, you get seagulls, they're not feeding on the same thing. The tuna are absent. As soon as you find that blue water, you find those mutton birds, bang, you're into the fish straight away. Okay, so let's say we find some clean water out to the 70 metre line, for argument's sake. We found some really nice, you know, rich blue, you know, clear water and you found some birds working. And obviously the trick is, and, and you guys have posted many times before, don't drive through, you know, the schools of birds working, you know, work around the edges. So are you deploying uh, some skirts and some deep divers or, and, and obviously a big change was a, a dredge bar teaser with a skirt on the end or hooks on the end. Could you talk us through how you set up your gear and what position on the boat and trolling speeds and what, how do you then work that? Okay, so basically my standard go-to beginning of the day is start, let's start fishing. And you're always going to go with the old faithful what works 80% of the times. And it does. 80% of the times um, we get quite a good result. So I'll, I'll set a standard pattern of two deep divers. I'm not one of these charter boats that run 10 rods. You, you'll never see 10 rods running off my boat or eight, nine rods. I'll try and stick to no more than six would be an absolute maximum. Most of the time it's five. You know, the pandemonium that comes about if, if every rod goes off, you end up losing quite a lot of fish and a lot of gear. Um, I'll, I'll run a standard pattern of five rods. I'll, I'll usually run two, two deep divers. So um, I just bought these two here, which are a Samaki ones. And these are just for example. I mean, I did, these were the most successful this, this time around. And there are Samaki, um, they're the shallow water 140 double D. So that's this one. And for, my, for a lot of people, and this is a lot of people didn't even um, sort of try these other ones out, but I had actually probably more success with the shallow. Same, same profile lure, but not the double D, just the 140 straight. You can see the smaller bib. I don't know. You need to hold it up a bit, mate. Yep, there we go. See the smaller bib on that one versus the bib on that one, okay? Now, the action on this lure is great. And um, so I run a standard pattern of both these, these two lures. Um, I run two, two skirts, which comprise of um, usually pusher type, type lures or slant face, usually a, a JB Dingo, which is one of my favourite go-to lures. Um, this season, I, I ran the JB Dreamcatcher. It's actually called the Dreamcatcher. Um, was made between me and Dave in, in uh, Jarvis Bay. And that, that seemed to really, really catch a lot of fish um, this year. It's a slightly heavier version in a six-inch lure. Um, I'll see if I can find it. It's probably hanging around there in, in, the, in the bag. Um, so I'll, I'll run two standard skirts, two deep divers. So they're going to be sitting in, in, in cl closer under the skirts. And normally I'd run a bullet head style lure on the shotgun, which is the longest lure right in the middle. So you'll, you'll have you'll have a spread with the longest run with the, with the shotgun. Then you'll have your two next skirted lures staggered slightly. And then you'll have your deep divers in front of them closer to the boat. Okay, and that's my standard spread. That's what I start with. This year, the shotgun lure was a bullet head style lure, which is, this one's a, a McKenzie. So that, that's about the size of them, guys. Now, this is a McKenzie bullet head. They're a relatively new lure on the market, but absolutely lethal on the, on the bluefin tuna. So were, the, so were the Jack's bullet heads, which are a slightly bigger profile, a bit of a heavier lure. So you can see the size difference in those two guys. That's the Jack's. That's the McKenzie. Um, both lures worked tremendously well this year. And both lures I had running on various types of um, dredge teasers, as you can see behind me here with the mold craft. I don't know if you can see that, guys. And yeah, that, with a multitude of uh, mold craft squid on it with the bullet. I find the bullet head lures work better on the backs of the dredges because they are a little bit um, heavier. They track deeper. You've got the dredge to create the turbulence that you need. 
Um, so you don't really need another lure that's creating that as well. That lure needs to stand out as like the Lone Ranger and bang. You know, the amount of times we just see, and, and like John was with me when we did get one explode behind um, the, the dredge in one of the days, and it seemed to be the go-to um, setup when the fish did go a bit quiet. Usually in the morning, they were more than happy to take deep divers nearly every time in the morning when I found them feeding, bang, boom, deep divers, sometimes double headers. And then as soon as that sun come up and, and was high in the sky, it seemed to shy, shy off that. You might get a couple on the on the skirt and then it was just dredged till the afternoon and then in the afternoon it was game one again, you know? Okay, fantastic. Now, I've got a question about some hard bodies. Now, just first quick, first quick question that the producers put up, Rich, is from Justin Murphy. He's heard that experienced fishers can smell tuna out there due to bait being smashed, etc. Is this true? This is correct, yes. Okay. It's correct. It's, it's hard... It's hard to teach people, but I mean, look, you've got to be cl- you've got to be in close proximity of what's happening. My nose is big, yeah, but it ain't that big, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, got, I got a good nose for smelling, but yeah, we talk about this a lot when we're marlin fishing as well, and I won't I won't go into the marlin fishing, but we call it. There, there's a lot of kill. There's a kill going on, and a lot of times with a kill, you'll see you'll see a slick on the water. It can be blowing thirty knots, and you'll see that the water will actually like pretty much like smooth out, even in rough seas. And you'll know that something below is feeding. It's creating oil in the water. It's creating like a slick. That slick can go four miles. And if you're keen enough and you know what you're looking for, you can actually follow that to its source. Yeah, I call it the yellow brick road. It's, it's led me to many a marlin catcher. It's led me to many a tuna. But when, you, when, you, when you're downwind of all this stuff and, and you smell it and you know what you're smelling, Yes, so absolutely. To that, the answer to that question is yes. Okay. So certainly um, the dredge bars were obviously a, di- a difference. Um, you know, these little Samaki red baits, I've changed these to singles just to tune them a little bit. And we'll talk about tuning a little bit later, Rich. But um, for someone that's going out there and might need to purchase some new gear and they say they want a bit of a spin rod set up, what sort of size are you thinking, strength rating, braid? you know, to get on the school tuner that might be able to handle one, say 30, 35 kegs, if, if, if they're lucky enough to get one? Well, that's a good question because this year I um, I did something that's a little bit out of character for me. You know, I'm always dealing with a lot bigger fish and, you know, I found myself in a fishery where I had to scale down everything that I do to continue with the success rate. So I went down as low and, and, and I've got some of the outfits behind me. And one of them is we've got John... Um, Johnny's um, lure that he's going to give away tonight, you know, the little jack fin. See that one? But this is only a tiny little outfit. This is a Saragosa uh, 5000. It's only got like 30 pound braid, and that leader is, I think, 30, 30 pound or 35 pound leader. And, and when they got really finicky, we held fish up to 20 kilos on that. Obviously, we had to play them. I had to drive the boat for them like I would drive on the barrel. You couldn't heave hoe into them. But the main part is we got the boy and we landed those fish, okay? And in terms of gear, most of the stuff I use for, for the big, for the dredges, I, I, I always ran an overhead outfit just purely because um, it's pretty heavy. It, it's, it's a little bit harder to lead around on, the, on, a, on a spin outfit. It's going to create a lot of drag straight away. So we were fishing a little bit heavier with the, with the dredges and obviously there's quite a lot of money worth of gear in there. And, and it's very easy to lose them. Um, even birds or smashing into your line can, can cut you off. But then on the other spin out bits, um, they're all Samaki rods. Um, yeah, I keep, I keep talking Samaki. It, it's, it's not actually because they're sponsoring me. I actually pay for all my gear anyway. Um, it's more that I actually started using their rods years ago and they're just almost indestructible. If you watch my videos and see, God bless them, the Asian clientele that I have that uh, are less than professional, they put the rods through so much torture that I've got to have rods that can handle the fish as well as the bad treatment from some very inexperienced fishermen. And, okay. and I get that with those outfits. So that's why I use that. And, and, and in terms of size, it's anywhere between 20 pound to 50 pound outfits. Okay, fantastic. So if someone went out there with a a pretty reasonable, you know, uh, uh, spin setup, even a Saragossa 10,000, 50 pound braid, or even a, a, a Tiagra 
30 wide with 15 kilo mono or something, that would be pretty good for a, I suppose that an overhead would be pretty good for a dredge bar setup, which has got a bit more drag, but running a deep diver, you know, more of a heavy style gummy shark rod, I suppose, could, could work for the tuna. 100%, 100%. There's no, there's no, um, there's no hard or fast rules as into what's right or wrong with it. If you look, if you look at the standard spin out, most of mine, uh, the Smarky rods, are actually designated jig sticks. You know, they're not designed, they're not a trolling rod. They never were designed for trolling, but they work well. And um, the application that we use in those rods isn't really suited to their design. If you, if you had to talk to Smarky, they were designed as a jig stick. And, and heavily used now throughout the industry as, you know, lighter trolling outfits used correctly. They're, they're great, you know. So like you said, you know, if you, if you had a little a gummy outfit, if you can handle a big gummy, it'll handle those, those cool fish tuna, 100%. All right. So one last question before we uh, introduce John back into the, to the show, and we'll, we'll give you a bit of a, a rest, Rich, so you can wet the tongue with a, with a, a beverage of appropriation. Um, how critical is it to be on the water for that daybreak, for that daybreak feed, to get on the water early? Or did you find that morning was better than afternoon or was there any sort of pattern to it at all? Let's, let's get something very clear. I am by far the biggest fan of afternoon fishing, okay? Like um, as much as we get out there and we try and be, out, be Johnny on the spot early in the morning, I, I'd have to say that a lot, I have a lot more success fishing in the afternoon even when I am there in the morning in saying that that morning window if you're there on the fish you will get that half an hour to one hour window where at times the rest of the day will be quiet so it is very important to get out if, if you know if you're not on the fish though it makes no difference if, if you haven't got the location to go to you don't know what you're just starting to fish and you really don't have a direction and you're looking around you'll blow that first hour of the morning possibly two before you find them and, and being out there in the morning was really an absolute waste of time. So, if, yeah, in saying that if you're not Johnny on the spot in the morning, you still won't do well. Okay, so afternoons perhaps maybe is a good thing for the average fisher out there where they might get a little bit of a longer bite window um, and, and a longer feed. Yeah, absolutely. You get, you get more time on it 100% in the afternoon. All right, so you have a rest for a minute, Richie. We've got loads of questions coming in, but we'll come back to you shortly. John, uh, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us again. And topwater fishing. So Richie's talking through, you know, chartering, running some skirts and, and deep divers or shallow divers and dredge bars. You bring a whole different edge to the game. So you're really sight fishing, finding some fish and, um, and casting what imitates what they're feeding on effectively Talk us through it. How do you start off doing it? Is there is it is it really technical, or can just anyone do it? Um, fair, fair point to make that first one about sight fishing because there's been so much of that this summer, where we've had visible fish where you can see the school, you can you can cast at individual fish if you like, but very often it's not that way. Um, probably the the more likely scenario is that you're in a you've found a situation where there are probably fish here. Um, you may have sounded them up. Um, there may be birds giving a bit of an indication that there are probably some fish or bait here. And our general thing is we'll set up a drift through that area using the current or the wind, whichever way it's, um, it's going to push us through that area. And we just cast, 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 cast. And, and um, th that, that's probably how most of our fish uh, initially come for sure if we see a bust up we're on it you know and and here's the funny thing because we're top water fishermen we haven't got a spread of five lures out the back guess who got gets to the bust up first we do because our rods are in we hammer down and and, and you know run and gun but for the most of it you know we're casting at the sign of fish and um in, instead of you know circling around there uh, trolling like i guess most guys do we're setting a drift line through it. We're casting, and if we don't see something we like on that drift, then then we're gone, and we, we'll look for the next bit. We cover a stack of water generally uh, on a given day. Uh, if, if all things are going well, we don't. You know, uh, we go out, find the fish um, early. Then you know you, you can get all the action you like in a morning, perhaps. But uh, it's often not that way with tuna fishing, and um, I think Richie made. Uh, super point a moment ago that um 
what, why a morning bite often doesn't work is because you haven't found the fish. You know, if you were on the fish, you'll probably catch them, but fair chance there'll be a tide change coming up somewhere like 11 a.m. early in the afternoon. You want to find the fish for then because tuna feeds so often pushing up to a tide change. It's not funny. So, yeah, it's we, we do a lot of miles. We do a lot of looking. Like sometimes those rods are in the rod holders and we are doing probably, you know, not full noise, but, you know, maybe 15, 17 knots and our eyes are just open looking for the sign that we're after. That's kind of how our days look, um, if, if we don't find fish, that is. Yep. Okay. So... Um, certainly, um, one of the things that we found out with whiting fishing is that, you know, or, or sorry, snapper fishing is that if you found and sounded up snapper and couldn't get them on the bite, couldn't get them on the chew, move to that next patch and find ones that are feeding. So similar sort of thing to, to top water that how many drifts would you give it if you, if you've sounded a pretty reasonable patch and you started casting because casting takes a bit of effort, obviously it's not, it's not lazy man's fishing by any means. How, how long do you just do one drift? Is it two? You know, what are you looking for? Is it just a bit of following activity on the lure or, or you know, tuna fins coming out of the water, trying to obviously trying to catch you, you want to stay, but um, what, what are the real telltale signs that you should stick around or, or versus bugger off? So if, we've, if we're marking fish and they're shallower than 20 metres, the school depth, we'll stay with them. Um, the, the only thing that would probably make us leave a school of tuna would be if it's inundated with boats driving over the top of it. Because in that scenario, the chances of the fish coming up and hitting a topwater lure are dramatically reduced. Um, there's be definitely been times this summer where we've gone, you know what, this patch is screwed virtually by the traffic and, and we'll gun it out of there and go find another patch of fish. And the beauty of this summer is you didn't have to go too far generally to find another one. Yeah, there, there were a few days where they were tricky. Um, I, I, we had one donut day, I think, this summer, which is amazing to say, like, you know, one <laughs> mm. um, out, out of, you know, probably a dozen or more trips on them. But uh, generally, if, they, if, if, if we're confident that we've got uh, schools of bluefin under us and they're not, like, hugging the bottom, we'll stay on them, man. We won't leave. Okay, so I think that probably answers a question from Philip Thompson, you know, if you fish top water, uh, where do you fish top water where other boats are trolling? I think that's essentially a no. You know, like you well, might start if there's one yeah. maybe to find some fish if you were doing a say a morning bite or maybe even an arvo, but fundamentally find your own patch and work it. And you're absolutely right. You know, we trolled for eight hours on a day that Richie also had a duck, and we we're talking about that before the show. But um, you know, it, there was just fish for for oodles and oodles of miles from Apollo Bay to, to you know the top end of uh, the, you know the top eastern end of cape shanks so you didn't have to go far yeah for sure the um the, the amount of fish out there this year, year has been absolutely stunning like uh, never uh never once this summer didn't find fish at least that yeah. that's stunning like in our local waters it's amazing okay so someone who's new to the top water artillery sort of set up john um you you come from a, a lot of experience with ebb tide tackle and andy um what does someone need to purchase to get themselves into top water fishing um of uh of local melbourne bluefin tuna and what might be a couple of things to not buy when you're focusing on top water fishing you, you know what if you're first getting into it mate i'd say don't buy much to be honest you'll probably find in your collection there's a a, a rod you only need one um, that will fit the bill. You know, it might be a heavy snapper outfit. It might be a, a, a light gummy outfit, you know, something seven foot two through to eight foot long that you can throw a stick bait on. Start with that. You know, a 6,000 to an 8,000, even a 10,000 size reel with braid. Give it a try. Like, don't go and invest heavily to begin with. But I guarantee you, if you do score a fish or two, that's when you'll start to think about it. You go, this rod kind of sucked. Like it, it, it really didn't work. I couldn't put any hurt on the fish. Um, I couldn't lift it because, you know, tuna, how, how hard they are to lift with their circling tactics by the boat. That's when people start to perhaps think about they might need some gear. And, and we, we've got, you know, oodles of specialised tuna lures and now specialised tuna casting rods. And you, you might think, you know, what, what's the fuss about all, all of that? And, a specific tuna casting rod has got a couple of attributes that when you think about it, you go, yeah, okay, I, I get it. So a tuna casting rod 
will be able to cast a really lightweight lure. Like it'll have a fair amount of backbone, but it'll throw a 30, 40, 50 gram lure a long, long way. Like a GT rod, for example, can't do that. There's no way. Um, but it could also throw maybe up to a hundred gram lure. So you can match a big variety of, uh, of baits. Um, when you hook up, you know, tuna fight down deep. They, they, yeah, you always end up in a vertical fight. They fight on their side. And long casting rods aren't fun to fight the tuna on. You've got a lot of leverage working against you. So these specialised rods have actually got a very parabolic curve and they lock up hard in the, in the, um, the last half, last third of the blank. And they make it really comfortable for you. They make topwater fishing, you know, actually fun and not painful. The... The uh, numbers of, like, I know we're talking school bluefin here, but the numbers of bluefin that are caught in the Mediterranean and the USA that are in hundreds of kilos, like a couple of hundred kilo fish that are caught on topwater casting tackle without harnesses. You know, the guys will be um, uh, using a belt bucket, of, of course, but, you know, they're not even harnessed up and they're knocking fish over in half an hour to an hour. And these are fish of those proportions really good technique plays a big part in that but a significant aspect of it is the technology of these rods mm, okay so uh, i think i was looking on your site the other night and you've got these wonderful hawk rods and, the, and the, really the the, the 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 little tuna one that we're talking about is not overly expensive for really what a what a rod is and we're talking you're saying that would be a great start i think we're talking 400 odd dollars which is certainly not a yeah. bank breaker by any means compared to some of the other stuff that's out there so talk us through that rod and you know what sort of reel you might pair it to and look i've, I've got to say we're giving away this little uh jack fin handmade uh pelagis uh 90s it was the last one on the site so no one's getting another one for a little while and Richie's going to talk shortly about what a game changer that was. I assume that they're the sort of lures that we should be looking for, or perhaps you could talk us through some of your lure choices. Yeah. So firstly, on just quickly on the the hope rods, they're um, they're Japanese blanks and they're assembled in um, in Spain by Mediterranean tuna fishing guys. The the hope little tunny is a seven foot three, perfect for our school bluefin. I, I actually reckon you could probably knock over fish on that um 50 kilos like you, you, you're not going to have much fun on a barrel with it that's for sure but you, you can catch a wide wide range of fish on that rod um in our local waters uh i run an 8,000 stellar on that i like stellars i like high-end fishing tackle you, you don't have to use a stellar you know you can use a ghost or whatever you, you want to use or your dial or your pen doesn't matter but um the, that lure you're talking about the the jack finn pelagus that's I got one of them there. So that there is more than one. I've just got some in my tackle box. Um, that uh, that was developed by the the guys in Italy um, for when uh, their bluefin tuna, the Mediterranean bluefin tuna, are locked onto small anchovies or white bait. They've got the same bait basically on the other side of the world. Um, they they recognise that bluefin or tuna generally have got an amazing capacity to lock in and have no interest for anything that doesn't look exactly like what they're eating anyone that's fished for uh blueies when they're on small bait will know this frustration and and they can just plow through clouds of it and gorge they don't grab individual fish they open up their mouth and charge through that's how they feed on these things they, they feed very differently on a red bait bait ball than how they do on a white bait or an anchovy school they just plow through it and, you know, there, there's an element of your lure being in the right spot that is quite a, a, a tricky thing because it, it, it's, that they're moving so, so fast, but it needs to be the right profile. If it's the right profile and it's in front of them, there is a good chance it might get eaten. But on, on their day, they can be so, you know, hardcore. I love it when they're on pilchards or red bait. They are a whole lot easier to catch when they are on a, a bigger bait, that's for sure. Though, you know, sauries. Sauries are a, a, a bait that when, when, when bluefin or yellowfin are on them, they're notoriously hard to catch when they're on that particular bait. And, and you know, like a brown trout on a dry fly, mate, you've got to match the hatch with these fish. You've got to get it right. And, and whether it's a skirt or a deep diver or a stick bait, you, you've got to give them what they want to eat. Okay, now talk about 
casting out? Um, are we letting it sink or is it, as soon as it hits the water, are we doing a retrieve? What sort of retrieve? Um, I think we've seen some videos of you. You seem to do a bit of a sweeping and reeling action. Seems pretty uh, easy to sort of be able to copy that on a myriad of the videos on your various social media feeds. Um, what's the technique? Yeah, so th there's a variety of both floating and sinking lures. So it's not just one particular time type, sorry. Um, floating lures, there's no nothing to be gained by waiting. But a sinking lure, by all means. And we will use sinking lures if it's horribly rough or if the bird activity is so thick that we don't want to be hooking gannet after gannet after gannet. Um, turns are generally too smart for it, but mutton birds and gannets love to grab a lure on the surface and you're out of the game. As soon as that happens, you know, you've got the, the nasty uh, de-hooking of, of a bird and you're probably going to get bitten. Um, that, that's when we will 100% go for a sinking lure and try to get it like a metre, six foot under the surface. The, uh, the rest of the time, I actually like to use floating lures and be right on top, um, mostly because that's when we get that explosive take. Like we'll, we'll show a video at some point. There's a little outtake reel of um, about a minute and a half of, of action from this summer. That's why. It's so cool when they're on top and they're smashing it. If it wasn't for that, I'd be trolling. But I want to see that and I want to feel the rod load as that happens. That's why we do this, not for any, you know, kind of other elitist reason. I just want to experience that with fish. So floating lures is, uh, is, is I guess, the, the purest form of it, but also the most spectacular. Okay. So if someone wanted to arm themselves, certainly that Jack Finn Pelagus 90 is a, is a wonderful topwater lure to someone to start with that did pretty well this year. What, what are some other different ones that you have in your kit that you think is important to have in the bag for someone starting out? Yeah, um, so I'll show you another Jack Finn. That's the, uh, the Pelagus 165, which is uh, the big brother to the one you've got there. That's a 75 gram sinking. That's in, the, in actually a, a red bait pattern. Um, that's a, a collaboration we just did with uh, Tuna Champions, that red bait colour. Um, I, I think there's a couple of those left on the site. That's the one I probably throw the, the absolute most. Um, if you like uh, poppers, the little hero, hero skip chat. Like they, they, these lures have caught bluefin, yellowfin by the thousands, mate, all over the, the globe. They're, they're, you know, crazy. The... Um, in terms of small lures, on a budget, the little bungee cast, Bass Day bungee cast, you know, another 28, 30 gram lure. Um, it's not through wide. If you catch a really big fish on this, it might pull it in half. That's a downside of it. Whereas the um, the Jack Finn Pelagus is a through wide lure. You can catch a barrel on that, man, yeah. um, on, on a 30 gram lure. You asked about retrieves. So the honest answer is what works on the day. Um, but tuna have no hesitation mowing things down that are moving fast. They've got speed on their side, so my retrieves are generally pretty quick. It's either a, a, a long, fast sweep and you've got to wind up the slack, long, fast sweep, wind up the slack. When the, when the lure is moving, it's, it's cranking, man. Um, or it's, it's like a flat wind with a twitch in it. It's, you know, there's, there, there's a number of variations of that, and I could, uh, should have put a, a video together. Honestly... During the course of a day, I will try hundreds of different variations of that if they're not playing the game. Um, it's just like, you know, try it with your tongue out, basically. It's just a, a bunch of different uh, ways of presenting it to, to try and give them what might trigger them on. Like, it's really frustrating when they're, they're there and they won't commit. You might get a boil. You might get like that little half-hearted follow where they've come up and just turned on it. You, you, you're probably close then. And, and more often than not, I'll look then go, what's the tide doing? And if we've got a tide change coming up close, they'll come on. They will come on for sure. Um, and you just keep doing what you're doing then. Well, we might just check out that video now. I think Ben, our producer, can cue that up and, and then we'll uh, come back and we'll uh, have a chat to Anth. Yeah, so I think there, there's no audio to this. This is just a, a bit of um, 
random footage from this summer, starting off at uh, Julia Reef in late January. And uh, there, there's a bunch of footage there from uh, Australia Day through to what was an amazing February where we just got out every moment we could and smash these bluefin from, yeah, the, from Portland through to the Western entrance of, uh, of Western Port. We didn't really push um, any further East from that. There's a little bit of footage there. That's a barrel right there. Um, obviously not from this summer, but it's a fair blow up. Uh, it's my, my wife, Lydia there on, and she's actually cranking on a little tunny right there. Um, it, it, it was an extraordinary bite. The visual takes that we got were so amazing. And th this is why we do it. We, we, we want to experience this. We don't want to just, oh, there's a, we're on, we're on, and turn around and pick up the rod and wind it in. That's cool. Don't get me wrong. But how cool is it when you get to experience and see things like this and, and you get that initial whack and screaming run of the, the first run from a, from a decent bluefin? This is the kind of stuff that I guess we, we live for and, and uh, this summer's produced it for us in spades. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thanks for sharing that vision because I tell you, if someone commits to uh, getting out there, um, no one does it more than you, especially in the, uh, the wonderful Centre Console on the, the worst of days as well. Um, that's commitment, so well done. do have a bit of a question that's come through behind the scenes. Now, uh, we hear a rumour that you do take Lydia because she increases your catch capacity and she outfishes <laughs> you on a regular basis. Is there any truth to this? Oh, straight away, I know who's posting this garbage. Um, uh, Lids, Lids goes all right, she does. But let's remember who puts her on the fish, right? Okay, yeah, it's important to find the fish. All right. So we'll now turn to a, a regular Just for Average Fisho contributor, Anthony. Thanks for joining us again, mate. And um, when the season got off to an absolute flyer, you and I were hoping to do a lot more fishing together, but times couldn't allow us to do that. And you went out and did a couple of solo runs. And um, you headed, you know, you got up early before the, the boats joined you and you did it in the simplest fashion. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, we, we had some interesting times this season. Uh, we had days where we just went out, didn't matter what you threw at them, they just absolutely annihilated them. Um, but what we noticed on one day, uh, we got a fish, I think it was late morning, like 11 o'clock. And... Um, it was on a white uh, crystal pakula, little six inch joby. And it was a very slow day. Like there was a lot of boats out and no one was hooking up. And uh, we got the one fish. And um, as I was prepping it for the ice bath, I um, split him, gutted him, and uh, had a look. And to my uh, behold, it was full of uh, white bait, like just tiny little white bait. And. Yeah. Um, as soon as I seen that, I literally switched to the cheapest lure in my tackle box, which happened to be the uh, old Tsunami Pros. And, the Kmart uh, Specials. <laughs> Kmart Specials. And it's a little white placky. And uh, we literally threw them at the back about 20, 25 metres. As we came over the school of, uh, as we came over the school of tuna, we literally dropped it back to in gear at idle and let these things swim. And they just got absolutely smashed yeah and um the lumo and the crystal pakula uzis were pretty popular and certainly on the the, the the teaser like what we call pakula shots which had a few little teaser skirts on them as well um because you weren't running a dredge bar at all were you no i did i did uh very late in the season but um prior to that no i didn't run a dredge bar at all and uh yeah we had uh, i think we had one one trip, two trips that were donuts, but um, but one of the days was yeah, just fishing. Yeah, that, that happens. Um, and talk through your setup because you do it pretty simply. You like to repurpose a lot of rods. Yeah, I do. Um, so this season, like I just used my gummy and kingfish one, which is um, Saragossa ten thousand, one of the new Therese seventy two M's, and. Just 50 pound braid FG to to um, three four meters of mono and off we went off to leader and on to lure. 
Yep. And what found the difference for you in getting fish on some of the days that others didn't? Mixing it up or getting out there at a different time, what was important for you, Anth? Um, mixing it up, um, I was... I was always very like. Obviously, you get a lot of boats that try to cut you off, or you're trolling as well. But they they were changing lures over, and when they're that close, you can see to a point what lures they're using. So you just try to mix up something that that, that someone's not running, if you can tell. Um, but honestly, for me this season, anything that was um, reasonably small and and white. Uh, in saying that, the uh, the old uh, Lumo Lua did do really well, but even four inch, four inch uh, white ockies worked an absolute treat for me this season. Yeah, well done. All right, so what we might do is we might just bring the panel together, Ben, because I'm sure we've got an absolute load of questions, and we've we've had actually a number submitted through the page. So I'll start off with you, Richie. I know you've just been slamming down some cake, so it's a bit, <laughs> of, a, it's a bit of a long question. Um, so one was asked through the page on, you know, we see through the Ch Tuna Champions site, through yourself and through John and so forth, um, the, the importance of the preserving of the fish as soon as you, uh, if you want to keep it for a feed, because it's absolutely essential to the, the taste, because a lot of people don't realise that these things are so hot internally that they'll cook themselves. Um, uh, do you have an, a, a, a go-to method in terms of one, two, three, four steps of what you do immediately if you're taking that fish for a feed? So is it, is it um, spike, uh, bleed, then br um, uh, like put the, the nerve stem wire down it or is it in a different order? And, and uh, you know, do you have a particular type of ice bag that you prefer because you think it keeps them cooler? Okay, good question. It's something I promoted extensively this year. Um, and I do it through all my charters. Like, so if you're a client on my boat, um, your fish are going to get looked after. I just refuse to waste the fish. They're, they're too nice to eat. I, I, I like to keep them from bruising. So there's a lot of things you'll see go on my videos. <laughs> I use um, yoga mats for everyone watching. Clark Rubber, they got them in spades. You know, little sort of inch, inch thick mats. Look, they're not the cheapest in the world. They're like 80, 80, 90 bucks for a little mat. Roll them up and you stick them in your cab, stuff them down the side somewhere. But they're, they're amazing in, in keeping the fish from bruising. That said, going back to, to what you were saying, Justin, and, and, and that question, um, look, there is, there is a way that is the right way and, and, and the right way of why, and, and this, you know, you've got to remember, like, I'm learning this stuff all the time as well, and I'm, I'm always improvising and changing what I do. And if there's a method that improves the eating quality of the fish, you can guarantee that I'm going to do it. If you go by what the scientists and marine biologists who I work extensively with, the process and, and in this order is brain spike, okay? Then bleed, then bring in the boat, core with the wire, then gut and gill, then ice in that order. That is the order. <clears throat> in saying that, I'm guilty of not following that order, okay? Um, but to most of the people, the most, the, the most essential thing to do is to make sure you bleed and ice that fish. If I had to put two things that were absolutely imperative that you do with a tuna, and that's any tuna, yellowfin tuna, big bluefin, small bluefin, is bleed and ice that fish as soon as you can. In saying that, a lot of times I will have a fish on the gaff, I will stick the knife and bleed it out. Now, for those guys who, uh, who haven't bled a fish before, I'm not sure, I get a lot of guys want to stick them in the gills. Um, it's... It's okay, but the correct way to bleed a tuna is they have a they have a, a lateral line running down down their fin, okay. And there's a lot of YouTube videos on this, so you know you, you, it's not that hard to find out. But they've got if you fold the tuna fin down against its body, it, it'll fold into like a little channel, and and the top part of that is where the lateral line runs down, okay. You can run a knife and make a very small incision across that lat lateral line, it doesn't have to be deep. I've seen guys stab it down to the bone. That's not necessary. It only needs, it's literally just below the skin. And done at the right time, it will bleed out very heavily. It is a messy process, which is why a lot of times I'll do them on the gaff outside the boat. 
um, and, 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 and you'll see, and you'll see, you'll see it bleed out there. Even brain spiking, if, if you don't have the rubber mats and everything, it's actually a good idea if the fish is secured on the gaff properly to, to brain spike the, the fish outside the boat. So you lean, lean down and brain spike. Like I said, the correct method, brain spike first. The heart still keeps pumping even after you've killed, killed the, the brain sensory organs and, and then you bleed immediately after, okay? I, I will not lift a fish into the boat onto the deck unless I put it straight onto the mat. You'll hear me some of my charters, I'll get quite cross if someone lets a fish get off the mat and bounces around. It's not an ideal situation because the fish bruises. It scratches up, I don't want to see that. But if you've ever done a charter with me, right at that, we will lose precious time where we could have probably been fishing and, and, and might have caught another one or two right at that moment but it's not going to do much for the two that we've just caught or the one that we've just caught. That's not going to be the quality that when you get it at home. And a lot of things change. It's not only the eating quality, but how long it lasts. That blood doesn't come out of it. It, it perishes a lot quicker, okay? And um, you asked about the bag. I actually bought the bag, and I mean, it's, it's, it's one of many bags, and I know I've jumped off the screen for a moment, but that's, that's, that's one of the bags I use. And have a look. Have a look at the size, so you can get it. I'm six foot tall, that bag's standing on the floor, okay? Now, that's not necessary for all those little ones that we get, but you definitely have to have something like that when you're targeting those big ones. You must get that fish cold. Now, taking one or two bags of ice, guys, everyone who's watching this just does not cut it at all. You know, one or two bags of ice, barely gets the water cold. Ice alone doesn't cut it, okay? You have to get that fish in an ice slurry, meaning ice and water, okay? If we, the ice will only cool the area it contacts. If you cool the water and surround the fish in water, it will cool the whole fish. When John came on the boat, we had uh, Dr. Sean Tracy, marine biologist, very, uh, very knowledgeable guy. And a couple of things he brought with him were a couple of thermometers, okay? Now, I do all the right things. I take 10 bags of ice with me, okay? I can tell you right now, a bag that size would take three solid bags of ice just to bring the water temperature to what we need and then continuously topping that bag of ice. I would not lose the water in there. I would make sure that we retain the water once it's cold because then you can keep throwing fish in there. We did an interesting test, and uh, one of them was to test the temperature of the water, okay, before we put the fish in. And um, when when he did when he did that, I was actually astounded with the fact that the water temperature in that bag was um, minus one degrees. Okay, so it, it it really went between one zero and almost minus. Okay, and and I've never thought that it got that cold. And, and we did this little test because the actual core temperature of the tuna was 28 degrees. And you'd think if you're throwing a 28 degree fish into one degrees or minus one degree water, it's going to cool down pretty quick. And we had a little ongoing bed. Now, you'll remember this, John, on the boat. Yeah. And, um, and, I was sort of certain that that fish would drop fairly quickly down to about, you know, anywhere in the low teens. And in, in actual fact, that, and it was only a small fish, it wasn't even a really big one, it was probably around the 18 kilo mark, and that fish took a better part of an hour to get down to about 22 degrees, was it, John, if I can remember correctly? Yeah, it was coming down very slow, man. Yeah, it was about 22 degrees. <laughs> And that, that blew my mind. It was actually a little bit quicker than Dr. Sean Tracy had anticipated. But even by the time we got back down to the boat ramp, which was hours and hours later, that core temperature was still in the mid to high teens. So those fish take a remarkable amount of time to get cool and get that core temperature. And we're talking about that core temperature. We're talking about from the bone out, not the outside of the fish. That's why we gut, we gill the fish, we make sure we take out the inside so that water can encompass the whole fish, cover every part of that fish and, and start cooling every aspect of that fish. Ice alone does not do it. 
one or two bags of ice alone will not do it either. It's it's better than nothing, but if you really want to do it right, you've got to go prepared. And and a chiller bag in a boat now for tuna is like a rod in a reel. It's one of those essential items you just must have. If you if you go and chase the tuna these days without a chiller bag appropriate to the size of the fish that you're hoping to catch, then you're not in the game. You're really you're not looking after the fish you're catching and, and you're really taking a second rate quality fish home. Okay, so a couple of other quick fire uh, questions to you, Richie, and then we'll get on to John and Anthony. Um, while landing a fish, do you have people on a charter jigging or using soft plastics to fish hang around while you're landing a fish, or are they, are they following? Are they interested? Uh, absolutely. Look, w when you're dealing with the smaller fish, 100%, a couple of the times when we were trolling lures and, and went through a, a really good bust-up, and we had one or several fish on, I'd immediately get somebody, if we were still in that vicinity and the fish were on the surface or we were in the strike zone, and a lot of times I'll see them on the sounder, um, I would immediately get someone on a jig and someone on a stick bait to cast and, and try and entice a second, third or even fourth hookup if we could, you know, and, and it's always fun, you know. A lot of guys have fish follow to the boat even if we don't get the bite because of the commotion that's going wrong, you know, there, there's, there's stuff going on. Fantastic. Okay, now, question for John. John, um, any recommendations on products to use for tagging fish, uh, you know, and where is it best to tag a tuna if you, if you want to tag a tuna, mate? Could I, before I uh, have a crack at answering that, just um, back up a couple of things that Richie said there. Sure. I've, I've always bled my tuna. I haven't brain spiked them. Um, I haven't caught them. Um, I, I gut and gill, of course, and, and I chuck them on ice. And I've always thought, gee, my tuna is spectacular. I love eating them. Um, that day I fished with Richie where it was best practice. You know, the, the things that changed were the order that we did things, but most importantly that the pithing occurred, the de destruction of the, um, the vertebrae, and the immersion in a full ice slurry made the most amazing difference to the eating quality of that fish. Um, we only killed one fish. Andy took half of it home. I took half of it home. And I've never eat, eaten better bluefin. Um, it was, give me more. That, that is too good. The, the other point Richie made about um, the time it takes to do that process and, and you know, the, the, you're not catching fish when that happens, 100%. But if you're going to keep a fish, it deserves that from the point of view of a bit of a respect to your catch, but also the, the quality of what you're taking home is freakishly good. Now, we, we always make a decision before we go out, we'll have, a, you know, just, uh, do, you, do you want to keep one today? Like, do you, do you want to, oh, yeah, actually, I want to keep a couple. I want to give the neighbour some fish, you know. We'll actually make a predetermined decision as we're heading out before we, you know, start putting fish on the deck. And I've had a couple of days this year where I've said, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll have half a fish. I'll share a fish with someone because we knew we'd go out again within a week and have another crack at them and get another fresh one. But what, what that meant for us, other than just, you know, being, I guess, good, responsible anglers and, you know, tuna champions, is we fish barbless hooks and we de-hook the fish in the water and we're probably casting again within about five to ten seconds after catching a fish. So when we, when we want to have those days where we just want to fish, when we're, we're, we're action to plenty, and, and Richie had a test to this, you know, it's a pretty good time to catch another bluefin within, within a minute of the last one. Um, that, that's a fact. So that, that's just one little thing about um, reinforcing what Richie was saying. Uh, your question about um, tagging equipment, look, I, I'm actually the wrong person to answer that. Um, the only tagging that I've been involved in is with, other people who are um, taggers. I know the, the place you do it, it's up against the dorsal fin. It, it latches in against um, the bones that go there. Um, I believe Hook'em make a good set um, and they also produce the uh, the tuna killing kits with the pithing cable. Um, I, I'm just using heavy mono for that and I just cut out a wedge now after seeing Richie do it with my knife on the, uh, the forehead of the tuna. Um, real, real quick one, if you want to see how that's done, on the Ebb Tide Tackle YouTube uh, channel, there is a playlist called Tuna Only. There's 10 videos in there that include a variety of different things from technique 
tactics and tutorials like um it, it goes through richie you know dealing with that fish and how to do best practice but um i, I do know hook and make a a good kit that's about all i can offer about tagging mate no they certainly do john that's absolutely correct and they are producing those tuna champion um sort of the pithing kits and the coras yep. as well so available through all good hobby uh, hobby fishing stores that uh, uh sell hook em gear by all means um, there is a question, but I think that this one you'll probably need to take offline. Chris Jenks said, if I was to buy four sticks, what sorts of brands would you be keen to suggest for a beginner? Well, I think we've covered some of that before, but um, if you said, how about we cut it down to the beginner's first stick that you've got in the ebb tide uh, tackle shop, what would it be? The uh, Look, and it, it's a bit of a shitty thing that it's not available right now, but I think every tuna angler in Victoria needs a jack fin Pelagus 90. That, mm-hmm. that profile just works. Um, e- even when they're not on small bait, it catches fish. You can catch a big fish on it despite its size. Um, they'll, they'll be back soon, and um, we'll let you guys know when, when they're uh, back available. Unfortunately, yeah. coronavirus hit Italy, you know, one of the hardest places early, and they're just getting back to work. And um, I'm glad to say that the Jack Finn team are actually working through an order for us right at this very minute. And um, we'll be expressing it here with uh, DHL. As soon as we can get it here, you'll know. Well, you might need to. Look, I think um, we've gone out and we've, look, just Ben's just behind the scenes has given me the numbers. This show is just going absolutely ballistic for us. If you are keen, uh, John, I don't know if people could put some expressions of interest or even some pre-purchases through to you and Andy over the next weeks. You might be able to upgrade that order. I'm not too sure if that's possible. I'd like to think that you're going to go gangbusters after this, and I know that I'm going to part with some of my hard-earned again with some of your recommendations now anthony mate um uh, a question for you um you have lawrence gear and certainly a couple of questions came through as what tuna might look like on a lawrence um sounder i think you've got a photo for yep. us you just want to talk through sort of what that is yep that's i'm running a hds carbon um they're, they're, they're not expensive by any stretch of the imagination these days, considering you are the top end gear. But I've just got a one kilowatt high wide, um, and that's the picture that I was getting. And literally, if they weren't shy, you'd seen that picture, you knew they were fish and you knew they were biting. Yep. And certainly, uh, to what John was talking about before, Anthony. In that, those ones there were probably in that sort of top 15 metre water column by judging by that picture. Um, did you find them, if they were deeper than that, or did you find that they were always in that sort of mid to top area when you were sounding them? Um, depending on, like, like the other guys have said, um, depending on the tide and, and what type time of the day it was, early in the morning we found them down a lot deeper. Um, but on the tide changes, yeah, they were coming up. That's probably one of the deeper photos from one of the days um but yeah we had them five five to ten meters under at, at some stage like yeah unbelievable fantastic and um uh i think we've just got another question for either one of you is rip charts um how much do you rely on an app like this for southern bluefin tuna in melbourne or both out the front of port phillip bay or even talking portland i suppose richie um, you have paying clientele that are relying on you to put them on fish and pick the right days. Um, I know I've seen you out in some pretty average conditions because you, you have an amazing vessel that allows you to do so and sometimes catching it, or you, you can get fish in average conditions like we all have before. But what sort of apps or, or you know, do you rely on rip charts or some other versions of uh, these sorts of data, sort of social apps that you can uh, log into that you suggest? Look, rip, rip charts is is a go-to chart for me, definitely down the east coast. My marlin fishing completely depends on it. Um, I've become a little bit of uh, a, I don't know what you'd call it. I wouldn't say I wouldn't say expert, but uh, definitely um, definitely proficient in looking at what to do. A lot of the guys that live in New South Wales use it for the yellowfin tuna, and they use it with strategic, you know accuracy that you can't believe like you know some of the guys that just really know what to look for and once you once you find that that said on the southern bluefin tuna front because we're not dealing with um say for instance on the east coast we've got the eac we've got those strong currents that come down from the top 
they mix with colder water. Same on the west coast of, of um, Western Australia, they have the similar currents. But down, down south, there's a few currents down towards Albany that, that do a lot of pushing, and they push across. But in, on the inshore grounds, the biggest thing that I find um, that in, in the past has led me to some good, some good tuna um, populations is chlorophyll. And, and it's still a sea surface temperature chart. But chlorophyll gives gives a location where there's likely to be a big bait concentration. Okay, so where the highest amount of chlorophyll is is generally where there's going to be a big bait concentration. Also, you want to sort of be on the edge of that because that's usually where that nicer, cleaner water is going to be. And and that's that's about the extent that I've I've used um, rip charts and and those those things in in our southern bluefin tuna fishery. If we move to the east coast, then we're using it extensively. You know, we, we, that, we, we're talking about a fish that's now not congregating on bait or reef structure, it's moving with the current. So a lot of our fishing down here is very reef or structure related. Um, so I tend to look more around those locations than the sea surface temperature charts, if that makes sense. Sure, fantastic. Now, one for John. Um, top water fishing, you need to be able to be in conditions that allow you to keep your feet on the deck in some respects. And we've certainly seen some videos of you transiting some pretty hard water to get out. And, and you know, you do it better than anyone from a top water perspective in the boat that you've got. What are conditions most that you prefer to, to fish in that you're looking for for top water versus, say, conditions that you just go, nah, that's, that's not for us today? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I wish I always made good judgment calls, but I don't. Um, the, 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 the typical glass out, you know, that really beautiful day is sometimes not your best hot water day. Um, not, not saying it won't be any good, but there's, there's probably a bit of a hesitation to, to break the surface to an extent. And that might be one of those times where I actually go a little bit subsurface with the sinking lure. The, um, I reckon 10 to 15 is your perfect top water weather. Um, they will come up and smash it hard in those conditions. When you're starting to get above that, yeah, you can, you can definitely, definitely still do top water, but you're starting to probably push the, um, the barriers of, of comfort for an, for, to an extent. Like when, when you're hanging onto the, the, the rod and you're working a lure, that means you're hanging onto nothing. You know, you're, you're on the deck of the boat. You're probably not on the casting deck anymore. You're just on the deck of the boat. Um, working away, you might find your back against the console or the back behind the um, the leaning post at the rear of the boat. I think um, somewhere between 20 to 25 would completely pull it up in terms of fishability. But, yeah, so a, a perfect day for me is probably 8 to 15. I, cool. I'm, I'm pretty happy when I see that. And, you know, it's always a bit stronger than they say without, without a doubt. Um, from from a comfort perspective and just the, the fish's desire to come to the surface seems to be a whole lot better when there's a bit on it. Yep, cool. No worries. All right. So uh, open questions to the panel. Uh, Ray um, Carabot, uh, hi, boys. Great talk. Um, do you dodge the tides, uh, moon phases? How do, they, uh, how do they affect bite times on the southern bluefin tuna? Maybe start with you, Richie. Um, look, all that stuff affects bite times, um, the dodge tide barometer. Look, I didn't, I didn't see a massive change in the barometer in terms of our catches, but definitely moon phase. Moon phase um, definitely played, played a part. And uh, look, you know, basically on, on barrels and versus the, the smaller ones, there was a difference. You know, I find like with the, with the bigger fish, we tend to do actually quite well on um, on dodge tides and and you know, full moons and new moons. On these little ones, the lead up to those, um, the, to that new moon and the lead up to the full moon was great. Um, they slowed up a little bit on, on, the, on the top end of those, um, both those events, the, the, the full moon and the new moon. They, they actually did slow up a bit. They were there, they were less likely, they were a little bit less reluctant to, to hit the gear. And that's when we started getting a bit of those slower days um, with with the with the bikes, you know, having to work a lot harder for them. But definitely leading up to it was very productive, uh, and and after it, but over the top of it, they did slow down a little bit. Okay, and from Daz's fishing reel servicing, probably one for you, Richie. 
do you match the lure skirt color to the dredge bar color when you're fishing using a dredge bar? Yeah, I try to, yeah. Yeah, if you, if you have a look at the dredge bar behind me, um, you'll see that's, that's uh, I don't know if you can see that, guys. Let me pull that a little bit forward. Yep. Um, this, is the one I, this is the one I designed. Um, so up until now, you couldn't buy this one. But you can now because it's been made by Black Pete Marine and, and supplied at Hooked on Bait and Tackle here in Werribee, in Opus Crossing. So if you have a look, that's one of the – that's that's the bird, little bird I use on the end. So you've got a blue and, and purple, and and that's the skirt. That's that's the Mackenzie skirt. And you also got the blue, purple, all the, the whole combination there together. So if there, to answer that question. Look, um, it's not the end of the world if you don't match them, right? Um, I'm not sure that you wouldn't get a bite. But, you know, you're sort of trying to keep in what, you know, that, that's, you're trying to emulate a school of fish. They're a similar school of fish. So, you know, you're trying to, trying to match that, you know, that lure at the back there is the strangler out from that bunch of fish that's smashing on the surface. That's what you're trying to trick the fish into believing. Yep, sure. And certainly um, the boy, uh, hook on bait and tackle with Mike down there, um, absolutely fantastic store. Um, over over there, and I think it's Hoppers Crossing, isn't it, Richard? Yeah, Hoppers yeah. Crossing, Old Geelong yeah. Road, Hoppers Crossing, and, and he's like I said, I designed those dredges that were absolutely, and the boys seen that firsthand. John was on the boat; they were absolutely dynamite um, on the day, and definitely on the on the given days. And, and now they're being reproduced um, and sold as, as yeah. an over the shelf item. You yeah. get them back during the season, but you can now from from Mike down there in in, in Hoppers Crossing. Yep, and certainly from the boys down at uh, my local store too, Richie, the um, Complete Angler Ringwood, um, we, we sold um, over 60 of the in-house made ones which were matched with the, the Lumo skirts and we're taking orders for those now at the moment, hoping that we're going to have a really big season and if we can get back to fishing in the next couple of weeks So for the boys down east. So. Absolutely. I think, every, I think every tackle store um, in Melbourne really got on the wave of that because, like I know, Michael had so many mould craft, you know, skirts and he, he'd gone through two separate big orders and, and on his, he's, he's on his third one now and they've just run out the door and they're now reproducing these for themselves as well, as well as shops making them up and selling them for, for clients. Yeah, yeah. I think what's really important that if you do want to get some from either Complete Angler Ringwood or, or we're suggesting Rich um, with Mike, um, uh, pre-ordering is absolutely essential because the availability of quality fishing components is generally what's only in stock with certain supplies at the moment. Some of that is drying up thanks to COVID because supplies have not been coming in and China isn't producing a lot of those ancillary skirts and bits and pieces which a lot of suppliers use. Um, as John spoke to before about Jack Finn lures, um, you know, uh, in Italy, just crank them back up again. Uh, this will be a painful time for us and also expect prices to rise considerably. So think about supporting those local t tackle shops of ours, most importantly. Um, yeah, they've been doing it hard and look, you know, especially for someone like yourself, Rich, that makes a living out of, uh, and, and lucky you've had your electrical license to fall back on because it must be tough for you. But we won't, we won't see out of the show with that crap. Another couple of quick questions and we'll bring the show to a close. It's been an absolute massive one. Um, uh, and again, open to the panel. Anyone want to put up a hand for this one? James Dracos, can you have success uh, jigging or slow jigging uh, on the top of deep schools? Yes. <laughs> yep, we did that this year. Yeah, um, I think we, 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 we were Yakimitos, Anth. Was that what? the Yakimitos, the heavy Yakimitos? Yep. Yeah, it yep. sure was. Yep, found the schools down deep. Um, I had a mate out with mine We uh, out with me. Um, we were on a fish and the other fish were just down deep and I just sent one down the bottom and, yeah, two jigs in and on you go. Okay. All right. Um now, Bass, our last week's Squid Pack winner, um, he's uh, he's joined us again the show. He said, what are the thoughts on coming up for months, May and June? The restrictions are lifted. Um, should we be targeting sort of local Richie or should we just be heading down to that Port Ferry, Portland sort of way? Um, look, it's I think everybody's probably jumping the gun a little bit with these restrictions. I mean, as a charter operator, and, and we're only here in Whispers, I, I'm, I'm as much in the dark as all of you guys at the moment. Like you said, yeah, I've, I've had to hit the tools 
just to pay the bills at the moment. It's been really rough for the whole tackle industry, tackle yeah. shop, charter operators, and a lot of friends are in the same boat. I'm not sure we're actually going to be allowed. Maybe I'm hoping that the charter operators will get an exemption for this, but I think from a government perspective, um, I'm not sure that they're going to allow travel from um, city regions out to rural rural regions like Portland, uh, Lake Simpson, and all the you know. I think they're going to limit that travel still. So I wouldn't jump on the the freight train at the moment, and we're going to go fishing because. It's, but if I, if I, it was me right now, and, and I love my big tuna fishing, that I specialise in that. That's one of the things that, that I really do specialise in with my business. Um, I will definitely be hitting places like Portland for now um, and Apollo Bay, another one of the unsung hotspots that people generally don't sort of uh, fish as much. Um, I know for a fact that there's probably going to be a good population of fish at Portland. Generally, when the South Australian fishery is up and running and, and they're doing quite well, it's very rare that Portland isn't either or one or the other. Usually those both those areas fish well at the same time. Um, sometimes one better than the other. Never, never, you know, you can never pick it. So definitely Portland would be on fire. I've heard whispers of some good fish sightings, um, both from land, both from commercial operators that uh, have been doing the commercial side of things in terms of the food gathering. You know, they're allowed to fish. So, you know, you've got the shark operators, your squid boats. They're all still allowed to fish even through these restrictions because they supply food to all of us. Um, in saying that, I have no doubt that there's possibly going to still be some fish out front here. Um, it's, it's absolutely impossible to know for sure. You know, we, we had just have a fish. We haven't maintained any sort of connection with that water and seen if the bait's still there. So it's definitely worth a try. I would definitely go and have a look, if, especially if we're only allowed to stay local. That would be definitely a, a, a must-do. Yeah, get out the front and have a look. But uh, if you're chasing big ones, uh, Paul is definitely always a good place to start. Okay, so a question to the three of you. Um, and, John, your, your question will be deviated a little bit. So to Richie and to Anthony, uh, your top three skirt colours that you go for, for, uh, for, and then John, I'll ask you for uh, actual hard body colours that you might have preference to. So, Richie, top three from you? Um, definitely Lumo, um, not in this order. Um, purple, purple, blue, and pink combinations, and blue, silver, pink combinations. Uh, probably my three favourites. Okay. Um, crystal Lumo and a blue pink. Yep. So certainly Lumo seemed to do a lot of damage in the smaller ones. Now, John, three colours for, for local tuna top water. So you can't not have red bait and red bait with its blue back or grey back can cover off for a pilchard as well. Um, a sari, um, highly reflective sided lure and pink. pink. Tuna and pink just goes together all over the world. Okay. Well, we've got one of those little jack fin pinks that's coming out to someone. And uh, here is a really good question um, from Jacques uh, Kint. Sometimes on the early mornings, I observed all the birds flying in the one direction. I've followed them to a certain extent, but it seems like they're just still going. So I stop and look around. Should you continue to follow them? And do they generally head to where uh, they were feeding the day before or head to potential food? Maybe Richie, you start off with you. What's the guy's name that asked this question? I think it's, it's a Jacques, Jacques Kint. I really like the way this guy thinks. And, and, yep. and that's it. yeah, this is exactly what I do in many days. Like I will pay a great deal of attention to the birds. And more often than not, Jacques, you know, you might have been unlucky in one of the times that you, you, you were looking, but more often than not, um, those birds will lead you down the down to the pot of gold. Trust me. And many, many times I have followed those birds, and you know it seems like an endless road. And and, and I've done it for like you know twenty mile at times, and then just almost ready to turn back, just give up throwing the towel. And I look, and you just see them dive bombing, and it's like, okay, these were heading off somewhere. And generally, you're the only boat there because no one else has done it. So yeah, that's that's man, you nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely leads you to the fish, you know. If, if, you're, if you've got the willingness to follow and travel, 
and you know, not playing follow the leader with a bunch of other boats and reports, it can often lead you to a pot of gold of fish where no one else is. Yeah, I think that's a really excellent question. And certainly if you think about um, birds, they're either uh, flying somewhere to house up and be safe for the night or they're flying somewhere to eat because that's what they do, you know. So, interesting uh, thing, Justin, just before you go on that, what everyone needs to remember is we fish for fun and to bring a bit of food on the table. Those birds go out fishing and their life depends on them finding fish to survive. So they are very, very huge key into finding tuna. Yep. I uh, put up a video last night on this very subject on our YouTube channel. It's, it's, it's what they do. Follow them. Yep. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, guys, you have devoted us a load of your time and your expertise tonight. I'm sure there's a load of questions. And what I do after, after every show when I get back inside and rest of the weary feet for standing here uh, is that I'll go through and answer as much as we can. And, and, of course, Richie and John, if they've got some time, they may be able to go through some of those. It's not expected, though. By all means, we want you to support our charter operators, our tackle stores, um, you can't do better than booking some time and learning off Richie with Dreamcatcher 2 sport fishing. Um, a lot of people say that booking a boat can be expensive and yes, that's true, but you've got to put into perspective to the knowledge that's passed and the fish that you can catch. Um, and John, with his uh, expertise and knowledge and with Andy as well, they've created a real unique position in the market for, for being top water experts at Ebb Tide Tackle. Check them out at Ebb Tide Tackle. And of course, the guys that always support us at Complete Angler Ringwood and uh, tonight for helping give away a few pack, packs of um, wonderful hard body lures, FS, F, SFT lures with Chris over in South Australia. And if you follow his page, they certainly have been getting some school tuna, those lucky buggers that are allowed to fish. Fingers crossed that we can all fish soon, but we do need to stay safe. The world's this interesting place at the moment. So hold on tight and hopefully it comes soon so we can all get back to it and improve the economy. Now, before we go, we've got to give away some fantastic pack of prizes. And this, this, this prize pack number one, um, and I'm glad that the producer has put it up because it was certainly the question of the night. So the Complete Angler and the Ebb Tide Tackle Pack, uh, if you contact me, this is absolutely a fantastic pack, well over $300 of value. Uh, Jacques, that is your question, following the birds and, and following that is just a brilliant question. If you contact me through the Just Your Average Fishos page, I will express post that out to you tomorrow. And the SFT pack number one will go to Justin Murphy. And the SFT pack number two with the, the Takumi hard bodies in it, follow SFT Lures uh, or SFT Australia on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, Justin Murphy and Andrew um, Birchink, contact me through the page and I'll get those lures to you uh, thanks to SFT Australia. So, look, I'm going to bring the show to a close because we've asked a lot of all of our guests. I know that there's hundreds of comments and bits and pieces with questions that we can't get to. Um, keep watching the show. We have another massive show coming with uh, next week, 8.30 on Saturday night, talking all things Port Phillip Bay and Western Port Snapper with some absolute snapper royalty, particularly on the Port Phillip Bay side. Uh, I'll announce that shortly, uh, probably tomorrow or Tuesday. Uh, Thank you, Richie, John, and Anthony for joining us. Ben for running the show. Uh, follow all of their pages, Dreamcatcher 2 Sport Fishing and Richie Abella himself, John Cahill himself, and Ebb Tide Tackle. Uh, fantastic pages to watch. Anthony, you can be followed at Anthony <laughs> or just through <laughs> your average fishos, mate. Thank you for joining and imparting that. Oh, good. Yeah, pretty easy. Good and uh, look, I'm absolutely besotten by the fact that you guys are tuna royalty and thank you for donating your time and making this such a big show. Until next week at 8.30, this is Justin signing off for the live stream show at Just Your Average Fishos. Come, like, follow. Make sure you're following the page. Make sure you're giving us the thumbs up and the thumbs up for supporting our local fishing tackle industry and the charters that we've mentioned tonight. Look after them. We'll be fishing soon. Till next week, 8.30. Catch you then.